But when you look at the science and you see that, you know, glucose spikes and crashes create cravings, hurt our fertility, make us have wrinkles, impact our mental health, it becomes obvious that we should all care about it. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and today our guest is Jesse Inchospe. Jessie is known on Instagram as the glucose goddess, where she documents her experiments with blood sugar monitoring. She has a master's of science degree in biochemistry. This episode is sponsored by Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is a healthy version of all the unhealthy cereal you loved as a child. It's very high in protein, low carbs, zero grams of sugar, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and with only natural flavors. The main ingredient is actually whey protein. There are many different versions of the nostalgic flavors such as frosted, fruity, cocoa, and peanut butter. My favorite one is the cocoa. They actually taste better than the original formulations with more crunchiness. Magic Spoon cereal gives you 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only 4 net grams of carbs in each serving. If you want to try out Magic Spoon, then head over to magicspoon.com forward slash seam and use the code SIIM to get $5 off any order. Magic Spoon is so confident in the product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they're gonna refund your money, no questions asked. So head over to magicspoon.com forward slash seam and use the code SIIM to save $5 off your order. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you have like a really like a cool and uh, fun Instagram account where people can see how you actually, you know, experiment with the different kinds of foods and how it affects your blood sugar levels. And I think it's very like educational and like eye opening a lot to a lot of people uh, to see, you know, what the actual, you know, kind of refuting some of the myths about like what is good for the blood sugar levels and that kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, maybe like let's start with, you know, uh, why did you start using the CGM in the first place and like starting creating a, a content around it? Yeah, it's a good question. So I've been on kind of a health journey for the past 10 years. Um, when I was 19, I broke my back. I had a bad accident. And then since then, I've been just trying to figure out how our bodies work and what we need to do to feel good in the morning. So I studied biochemistry, and then I went to work in the field of genetics in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to put on a CGM. And this was 2018. And um, so I put on a CGM for the first time. And for me, it just it just kind of clicked in my mind that this was going to be something that was going to help me tremendously because all of a sudden I felt like I could speak with the inside of my body. You know, I could get feedback from my biology on what was happening. Um, so I became just really fascinated by this technology and I tried to understand, you know, what is the set of rules I could define that would allow me to understand how to keep my glucose levels steady and how to avoid the glucose spikes, which, which are bad for you. So I dove into all the scientific papers and I started running experiments on myself and I discovered some pretty awesome, useful, cool stuff. Um, and so after showing my friends and my family, I put the information online on Instagram just so that more people could gain access to it. Uh, and then it just sort of blew up um, by itself. I think people became very interested in seeing nutrition science explained through, you know, my own glucose data illustrating the concepts. And I think that was really key and interesting. Mm. Yeah, like, I think it's, it was relatively new. Uh, and even now, even now, there's not a lot of people who actually use it. And there's not, a yeah. lot, it's not like that easily accessible, although they're like, some new companies are coming out uh, with uh, commercial CGMs and things. But, you know, before that, you were able to just get it from a doctor who prescribed it to you, uh, but... Uh, so, yeah. yeah, and actually, so, you know, I'm French, and so I would get them in France where it's, they're over the counter. So it was ah, really, really okay. easy, but in the US, it's quite complicated, but in Europe, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to get them online, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's true. Uh, but now it's more like, yeah, these uh, specific apps that uh, are tailored to the CGM and uh, give it like these graphs and stuff. That Correct, yeah. More they, all, they all use the sort of the same base hardware the actual device is the abbott freestyle libre and then mm. each company has built their own um, opinion their own solution for what the best glucose app is so it's quite cool to see you know how they differentiate and what markets each of them serve mm. yeah but I, I think maybe a lot of the questions people may ask is like if you don't have diabetes like why would you use it <laughs> why would you use the cgm if you don't have like any um, yeah actual diabetes it's a good question and for the vast majority of uh, the past, <laughs> we, we thought that only diabetics should care about their glucose levels. 
But since 2015, we have really good data that shows us that actually 80% of people who do not have diabetes still experience big glucose spikes every day into the pre-diabetic or diabetic range. And with those spikes come consequences that impact us short-term and long-term. So more and more studies have come out really explaining that actually everybody should care about their glucose levels. And we're very much at the beginning of that. But when you look at the science and you see that you know glucose spikes and crashes create cravings, hurt our fertility, make us have wrinkles, impact our mental health, it becomes obvious that we should all care about it. And then, but I would say like, there's a difference between caring about your glucose levels and wearing a CGM. Mm. I think the work that I do is trying to help people who don't have a glucose monitor actually um, implement a lot of the hacks that keep your glucose levels steady, right? And so I think the first step is to do that. And then if you want to go further, it's to wear a CGM, but they still cost um, quite a bit of money. And so I don't think everybody can afford that. And I'm trying to serve the the part of the population that can't afford a CGM, but wants to get their glucose levels healthier. That's mm. my work. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree totally that, you know, let's say these big swings and uh, most people aren't aware actually like what their regular blood sugar level is. And uh, yeah, it has like a huge impact on health, you know, not only like diabetes, but also like metabolic syndrome and uh, yeah, premature aging and those things can be uh, totally. caused, caused, caused by this just excessive amounts of a blood sugar or high elevated blood sugar all the time and um, yeah, if you don't actually you know with a cgm it's easy because you can you know, just see all the time like 24 7 what the data is uh, compared to like a finger prick that you need to kind of yes. use it regularly so it's much yes. more convenient at least like in the short term to use like and see you know uh, what kind of uh, responses you have because it's very like individual as well like some people may you know, shoot up quite a lot to a particular food like a banana, whereas others don't, or like some are allergic to, let's say, uh, gluten or whatever, and their blood sugar rises. So it's it's always like 100% individual, and there there is no objective, you know, uh, response to every people, every person. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. No, no, no. Um, every person has a different response to the same food, but if you look at the science, you know, there are very big key principles that work for everybody. Oh, so you and I, so you and I, if we eat a banana, we might have a different blood sugar response. But if both you and I had some apple cider vinegar before or had the banana with some nuts, both of our spikes would be proportionally smaller, mm, right? Yeah. So the principles apply for everybody. Then to see within a category of food, you know, which fruit spikes you more than the other, that's an individual, where, that's where individual response comes in. But mm. no, we have, we have very established principles that work for everybody. Yeah. yeah yeah for sure like i agree with that uh, yeah it's just yeah like some individual um yeah nuances and uh, like how big the spike is gonna be that is like individual and depends totally on yeah yeah and another reason i think it's cool when you are able to get a cgm is that you know it really sort of motivates you to do well when you see the mm. response of your body to implementing one of the hacks to share for example um it's a good reinforcement to actually see the hack at play inside of your body and i think um that's also one of the great things about cgms is just to get feedback in real time on what you're doing i think it's yeah, really yeah. awesome yeah and it's also fun like <laughs> it's like you know fun to use it and uh, look at the data and look at the yeah. graphs and becomes like almost like a game like a gamified uh, yes. way of the same way like with the sleep tracker like if you track your sleep mm -hmm. then it becomes like this you want to score higher points and actually do better and uh, makes you actually make better health choices. Yes. Yeah, more, more careful with like overeating uh, carbs or whatever. <laughs> totally. Exactly. But, have, but you, I, have you tried a lot for a long time? How, how long have you had one on? I will have tried one like maybe a year ago. Uh, I'm going to try again uh, this time. And actually I'm going to, with my girlfriend, we're going to do like together Nice. For, for this time period and we're gonna yeah see how we're gonna you know different differentiate between each other uh, from the blood sugar and um yeah i think it's you know quite fun that's really cool very yeah. fun <laughs> you'll have to share the results with me i'm curious yeah yeah i'll do like a video probably about it today. nice <laughs> nice uh but what have you learned like what are the biggest lessons you've learned from your own uh, cgm use i think before i wore cgm i had this belief that in order to keep your blood sugar levels steady you had to cut out all carbs i thought that like that was the the solution <laughs> turns out there's a lot of stuff you can do to still eat carbs starches and sugars 
and keep your glucose level steady. And my first experiment was around pasta because I love spaghetti. And so uh, I think the first night I wore a CGM, I had a spaghetti for dinner and I saw a huge spike. So my first challenge was how do I eat the spaghetti without such a big spike, without, you know, all the consequences on my body that the glucose spike might uh, bring with it. So my solution was I started implementing um, a spinach salad before the spaghetti, because if you have fiber before you have starches, the fiber coats your intestine and then you actually absorb less of the glucose from the starches. So you're eating the same spaghetti but it's creating a smaller glucose spike. So I started doing that. Then I discovered um, the whole science of vinegar and how vinegar actually tells your muscles to soak up glucose faster when it arrives into your bloodstream, making the spike even smaller. So now I had the sequence I had, okay, before the spaghetti, I'm gonna have a big spinach salad with a vinaigrette. And then with the spaghetti, I would also add protein. So I would have like soft boiled eggs with it as well to sort of create this nice package for when the starch mm. lands in my system. It doesn't, it doesn't actually diffuse glucose as quickly and as violently. It's, um, it's tapered by the fiber, it's still done by the protein and the vinegar. And all in all, I was able to have spaghetti dinner without a spike. So that was a pretty mm. cool first mm. experiment for me. Big mm. success. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh... Fiber is one of the biggest ones that lowers the blood sugar response and yeah. vin vinegar is great. And even, even things like, you know, uh, protein and um, these different kind of polyphenols, uh, like there's some, you know, some research about how like you, the meal actually before the following meal determines how your blood sugar response is going to be. So even if you eat like an egg before for breakfast, then your, your lunch blood sugar response is going to be lower because if you have like this uh, protein and satiety, from the egg and uh, or like um, whey or like whey protein you consume like whey protein a few hours before the carb meal then your blood sugar response is also going to be uh, smaller from that so it's yeah you could absolutely there's actually a lot of like you know ways to um hack it so to say so make it more healthy and uh, less impactful on your uh, blood sugar levels exactly you know, it's really really cool when you start discovering this stuff and it opens up like this whole world of experimentation you know and it's not just what you see on the glucose monitor because you actually feel it you know, you actually feel less tired after the meal, you have more energy, you feel lighter, you sleep better. So it's really cool because the impact is instant mm. on your mental and your physical health. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what is, let's say, you, you, what would you consider high? Like what, is, what, what, what are some levels of you know, your normal blood sugar response and where do you consider something that starts to be more you know, elevated and uh, where do you, let's say, you, where do you not want to go? Like where is like the diabetes range? So if you look at the medical guidelines, um, they say a few things. So they say that your fasting glucose levels should be under 100. And then they say that after a meal, you should never go above 140 milligrams per deciliter. And that's, that's the medical guidelines. If you look a bit further in the studies, um, but they're really early, so we don't really know for sure. It seems that actually an ideal fasting glucose levels uh, glucose level is more like underneath 90. And then if we look at um, in healthy individuals and people who don't have diabetes, if we look at the glucose spikes, it seems that actually the objective might be to reduce any spike of more than 30 milligrams per deciliter after a meal. Um, and the, the thing with glucose is that the lower, the better, you know, but you want to be careful because sometimes you can lower your glucose levels by adding other stuff into your diet that might cause other consequences. So if you add a bunch of like vegetable oil to your meal, your glucose response is going to be lower because the fat is blunting the glucose arrival, but you're giving your body all this unhealthy fat, right? So that's one, one example. Another example is like alcohol. If you have a glass of wine before whatever, a cocktail or something, before you have a meal with a lot of starches, the glucose spike will be lower because mm. the alcohol is going to your liver and it's actually preventing your liver from producing any glucose. Mm. So you'll see a smaller spike. And so you'll be, oh, I have to drink wine before every meal. <laughs> actually, that's not the case, right? Glucose is just one of the variables that mm. we have to look at. So it becomes quite complex when you when you start wearing it and testing it on yourself, which is why what I try to do on my Instagram and in my book is to sort of simplify everything and just say, what are the big principles that allow people to have steady blood sugar levels without doing things that might cause other issues. Mm. Yeah, and that's super interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, like obviously, let's say metabolic syndrome, which is 
let's say super bad for your health and increases risk of heart disease the most would be you know it involves not only high blood sugar levels but also like high triglycerides and uh low yeah, hdl and, uh, yeah, high, yeah. Blood, high blood pressure and yeah just waste circumference and those kind of things uh, so yeah it would be very important to know those things as well uh, but yes what is yeah like what happens you know let's say you eat only you don't do anything for blunting the blood sugar um you eat yeah just you know straight up white bread or something like that uh what, what is what is the spike gonna do you know what is inside the body yeah what's the effects yeah so there's three main mechanisms of how spikes lead to consequences in the body the first one is that every time you have a glucose spike the glucose enters your cells and it overwhelms your mitochondria. Your mitochondria are really happy when they get some glucose because that's how they make energy. But if you give them too much glucose, they sort of freak out and they go and strike and they're like, I can't handle this big spike, like I'm shutting down. Your mitochondria become stressed. And then they start producing these molecules called free radicals. Free radicals lead to oxidative stress, lead to generalized inflammation. And this is just this sort of chain reaction of stress from a glucose spike inside your body that leads to the development of diseases. Second thing, oh, and by the way, if you eat something sweet, so that has glucose and fructose in it, um, that has table sugar in it, basically, this process happens even more. So that's something to keep in mind as well, is that if you see two spikes, one from, let's say, a piece of toast and the other one from like a cookie, if the two glucose spikes are the same, the one from the cookie actually has a hidden fructose spike as well. Anytime you taste something sweet, um, especially in desserts and pastries and that kind of stuff, if you see a glucose spike, there's an invisible fructose spike as well happening that harms your body even more. So the first mechanism is this mitochondrial stress that leads to oxidative stress and inflammation. The second one is aging, as you mentioned. So with every glucose spike, glycation happens in the body more and more. And glycation is aging, and it's the reason why our organs fail and we eventually die. So the more glucose and fructose spikes, because fructose also makes it go faster, um, the quicker you age. So that happens internally with your organs, but also externally. You see wrinkles, and you know from, from the outside, you look older as well. And then the third process by which glucose spikes impact our health is that every time there's a spike, your pancreas produces insulin to take the glucose away and store it into your liver, your muscles, or your fat cells. Um, and this is good because it helps your body um, prevent the damage from a glucose spike that would be too high, but it has its own consequences. You know, too much insulin over time leads to the development of insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. And importantly, these three processes, they go even faster if you're having, if you're eating something sweet. So that's why it's always better to have something starchy than to have something sweet. Mm, right. So um, would you say, so you're saying that the, like even just the, even if the spike is like, let's say higher in the short acute term, then that's worse than um, a chronically yes. slightly elevated blood sugar. So let's say like, Absolutely. If, you, if, you're, if you spike it once to like 200 milligrams, then that's worse than having 130 milligrams all the time. So I'm not sure exactly, like, you know, I don't know exactly the scale of like, is 130 the thing or is, is it a baseline of 120 that's okay versus 200. But what we do know from the science is that the, it's, the, it's the spikes and the dips that create the most, the most stress, stress in the body. So mm. it's been studied specifically on blood vessel cells. And they've shown in the, in the studies that yes, you know, a spike is worse than a steady, slightly higher baseline. Mm. But I'm not exactly sure, like, where's the whether, limit? Yeah. Where's the limit? You know, if a 200 spike is worse than, is better than like a 120 baseline or 140 baseline, like, I, I'm not sure. But mm. generally, it's the spikes that we want to avoid. Yeah. Because they cause right. the most damage. Mm. Yeah. Well, I personally may, may think that, yeah, I don't know <laughs> specific either. Like, where's the limit? I would maybe guess that, you know, let's say if you were to have, pre-diabetes for 10 years then that's probably worse than uh, let's say having cake at a birthday like let's say once a week once a month or something like that like if you eat the cake then your blood sugar will rise uh, but it's but the, if you are other at other times are you're like you know healthy and quite low blood sugar then 
I mean, is that still healthier than having like pre-diabetes for you know an entire year or two years, ten years? Like in the end, I think like the pre-diabetes uh, having this blood sugar level at around like 150 or 130 or 150 all the time, 24/7, may actually over time just you know uh, just accelerate more the aging and cause more damage just because it's you know 24/7 uh, elevated. Whereas yes. even even if even if you eat like a piece of cake. Or let's say more cake, or that you you actually eat like Oreos or whatever. <laughs> uh, even if your blood sugar goes like 210, 250, but it drops back down, then by that other times you're like relatively healthy. Like, is it really worse than having pre-diabetes for no. like five five years? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I I definitely don't think that that's the comparison we can make. Okay. I think it's more like if you have fasting glucose that's at 92. But mm. every day you have big, big spikes into the gotcha. 120 range. That's worse than having a steady 95 fasting that never moves. You know, it's oh. more like it's more like that. We're not okay. talking about. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not talking right. about such a big range comparing prediabetes to to no diabetes. Um, gotcha. I think that would be extending too much. I would look at the studies, but definitely intuitively, uh, I think it's pretty clear that it would be in the sort of smaller, lower ranges. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like you would like the most, the majority of the day, you would still want to be like around a hundred, maybe below a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Especially yeah. at least like while fasting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But okay. it's really, it's really interesting because um, there's also a genetic component to all of this. Mm. You know, your fasting glucose level is also related to your ancestry. For example, people of East Asian descent, they just naturally have a higher fasting glucose level. Mm. We know that our gut influences our fasting glucose level. We know that stress influences it as well. Hydration. I mean. There, there starts to be a lot of variables to, to sort of understand and peel through. And so I've tried to, to simplify all this because it can get quite confusing. Right. A lot of people tell me that they've got a, they, they've got a CGM and that it really clicked for them when they found my work because it allowed them, it allowed them to sort of understand and put context around everything so they could make sense of it. Because I think if you're just dropped into the data, it can be very... Um, quite challenging to like understand what's happening and what's good and what's not good and what to do mm, yeah for sure well that's good good clarification yeah. uh what 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 determines the blood sugar rise in the first place so like uh, you, you you we already talked about that my blood sugar response would be something different from someone else's towards the same food so what determines um how a particular person will respond to like a meal yeah so it will be a combination of many, many things happening in their body. So it'll be how quickly they're eating, how hydrated they are, what the composition of their gut bacteria is, their stress level, their age, their metabolic health, um, you know, how well they slept the night before. I mean, it's just like, you and I will definitely have different responses to a banana because, you know, we're just different people. We have completely different bodies and microbiomes and, and lifestyles. Uh, it also depends what you ate for your mm. previous meal, what you ate the night before, how much muscle mass you have. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, yeah. <laughs> which is why I think, you know, while that is interesting, I think most people get a huge amount of value by just sort of applying the, the key principles, which are eating your vegetables first when you have a meal, starting your day with a savory breakfast instead of a sweet one, incorporating vinegar, moving after you eat. If you want something sweet, having it as dessert instead of as a snack, you know, those kinds of things go a super, super long way. But when you and your girlfriend do the testing, you will definitely see very different responses. However, as I mentioned, like if you both eat a banana, you might see very different spikes, but if you both add nut butter to the banana, both your spikes will be smaller. Mm. And the thing is, you can't really compare two people's glucose spikes and just like make a judgment call about which person is healthier mm. because it, 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 there's just so much stuff going on. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, for example, like you can, um, let's say if you exercise before eating the carbs, then it will also uh, shuttle the glucose faster into the cells, like the uh, Resist, let's say near maximum intensity muscle contractions are gonna recruit the GLUT4 receptor yeah. to the cell surface that actually drives the uh, glucose into the cell without needing exactly. insulin. So even if you're like insulin resistant, 
let's say exercise will uh, bypass that thanks to this blood four exactly. regulation. So you can, yeah. yeah, if you exercise before, <laughs> you can have like a better blood sugar response uh, if you're diabetic and obese than someone who is fit, but they, let's say, eat the carbs while being sedentary and uh, after waking up, for example. Exactly. And also like if you've been fasting for three days and then you eat mm. a banana, you're going to have a much bigger spike than if you've been eating for a while. Also, if you're somebody who has ovaries and you have a menstrual cycle, depending on when you are in your cycle, the levels of hormones in your body will be different. And so your response to the same food will be different. So it's just like the constellation of variables is so wild. I mean, it just like it blows my mind. Mm yeah uh, are there any like um, like supplements that help with that are, are you using any supplements with the blood to help blood sugar it's interesting i'm starting to look more into that so the big one that we know works really well is vinegar so the acetic acid in the vinegar has a huge impact on telling your muscles to uptake more glucose so that's really really useful um, then people find that berberine works, cinnamon works. I'm going to start experimenting with probiotics and just sort of see if, you know, you can change stuff in your gut in terms of the metabolism of the glucose to actually move the spikes and the fasting level. That sounds really interesting. But I'm not a big supplement person. Apart from vinegar, I don't really take anything from my glucose levels because I find that what has the most impact is just what I eat, you know, mm. the hacks. Mm -hmm. um and i just don't like taking pills every day right. i just I, i'm not i'm just not that kind of person yeah mm. but there's a lot of stuff to a lot of cool stuff to try for sure for sure yeah. but you can't like out supplement a bad diet like if sure. you're just eating starches and sugars it's not because you sprinkle some cinnamon on it that it's gonna make a difference <laughs> <laughs> maybe if you take like metformin maybe a little bit but <laughs> that's not like yeah. recommended for most people i think yeah um, i mean that's you know that's a that's a proper pharmaceutical mm. drug um that's yeah. prescribed to people with diabetes so yeah yeah so that's uh, one, one, the ball one good uh, or simple one is also chromium uh, so chromium picolinate mm. has like a long uh, let's say history of use for um, blood sugar and insulin resi resistance and uh, even like cholesterol levels so what chromium does is just it um, basically um, activates this uh, chromodulin which is this uh, enzyme that also helps to basically shuttle glucose into the cells. So if, if you have chromodulin with the chromium, basically, or chromium activating chromodulin, then uh, you're going to, yeah, the, the blood sugar is going to be, or you need less insulin to get the job done. And uh, if you are insulin sensitive, then the insulin res response is going to be more enhanced so that the oh, blood cool. sugar would be lower or faster. Nice. Have you tried it? Yeah, I take it actually almost quite regularly like really? um, because like yeah I, I take it like on the days like I do the sauna or because you lose a chromium from the sweat so to replenish that so I just take um, take it uh, and it, in some studies it also helps with uh, body composition so like these bodybuilding studies they find it that it helps uh, with that so some bodybuilders actually also use it <laughs> very cool very yeah. cool nice 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 yeah i'm gonna look more into this i think it's really interesting but so far i haven't really um dived very deep into supplements it's my mm -hmm. next uh my next field of study mm. uh, how to are there any way yeah like we mentioned a few of them how to make yourself more insulin sensitive like by default you, to let's say be because there is some like uh, let's say misunderstanding about insulin like obviously you don't want to have high insulin levels but um, like not enough in insulin can also actually you know make you have high blood sugar levels because you're not producing enough insulin to shuttle it into the cells oh yeah um, no insulin is very important yeah. i mean without insulin you die so yeah. people who have type 1 diabetes who have lost or don't have the ability to make insulin they have to inject themselves you know several times every day with insulin to compensate for what the pancreas isn't doing so it is a vital hormone it's not like this just this bad thing we absolutely need it but it's kind of like you know there's the right amount and then if you have too much of something good um, problems start happening i mean if you give a human too much oxygen they pass out if you give a plant too much water, it drowns, you know, like we need insulin, but too much starts creating issues and it starts reducing insulin sensitivity. And then you need more and more and more. And then that's type two diabetes metabolic syndrome. So it's, uh, it's just important to remember, like insulin is normal. It's a vital part of our functioning body. It's just when there's too much for too long, that problems happen. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think yeah, the best thing to do is to obviously exercise and uh, build some yeah. muscle mass. That that makes you more very insulin sensitive. Totally. And eating also foods that help with insulin sensitivity, like you know, um, cinnamon and um, eat, like some one one supplement I also like is inositol. So that also uh, yes. helps with uh, basically producing insulin and um, and you get like some foods with inositol, like like grapefruit, which is a uh, known to help with also blood sugar response yeah so yeah 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 absolutely absolutely but so I, why yeah i'm obviously because like some of the controversy is also that you know if you go low carb then um, you're not really becoming more insulin sensitive like you improve your blood sugar levels and insulin levels but you're not really becoming more insulin sensitive because you're mm. you're not eating uh, foods that raise insulin and um, over time your body actually becomes less efficient at it so if you eat carbs, then you're healthy and you do all the right things, then still producing the insulin is still going to make you a lot like more insulin sensitive. Um, and um, you, so you basically don't want to be basically keeping the blood sugar low all the time or being in full ketosis because that will eventually also make you a bit insulin resistant. Interesting. Yeah, the, the one study that I found that was kind of on this topic is that um, if it's, it's around fasting and the first meal you have after you've been fasting for a long time. Mm. So if you've been fasting for a long time um, and then you have carbs, your body, your body's insulin levels are so low that mm. you get a massive glucose spike. And so you get all the harmful consequences. So what you're saying is like you have to remind your body to train itself to produce insulin when it yeah. needs to so yeah. that it doesn't just shut off the production completely. And then you might get consequences when you do eat stuff that rises your blood sugar levels. Yeah. yeah 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 that's like chronic ketosis can uh, kind of cause it so so cyclical at least what I, what I think is like a bit healthier so um, what do you do you do cyclical ketosis uh, well i'm not uh i'm not like full ketosis uh almost ever um yeah. i do i do like a cyclical i do fast as well like i eat once or twice a day so i get yeah. this period of uh, this some semi-ketosis in the morning and uh when I, when I do it, like most of the time I eat like still low carb, but I'm not like uh, worried about the carbs. I'll just eat vegetables yeah. and uh, things like that. Uh, but on some other days I eat yeah like more carbs with some potatoes or fruits and uh, especially after workout. So I'll use the carbs to help with um, muscle glycogen and uh, recovery. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can adjust the carb intake based upon my physical activity. So if I'm exercising more, then I eat more carbs. If I'm sedentary, then I just eat less. Yeah, that makes sense nice when are you starting the experiment with your girlfriend <laughs> well uh, we're waiting for uh, to set up with the app uh, but um, maybe like in a few days tomorrow nice. or something yeah so exciting <laughs> Very cool. the, vid the video should be out uh, before this podcast comes out so <laughs> nice <laughs> so you can reference it <laughs> yes <laughs> you can send people to it yeah um but uh, let's say you messed up you ate foods that raise your blood sugar quite high and maybe you eat like a cheat meal or something so is there ways to like repair the damage or how do you let's say go about lowering the blood sugar after a meal yeah absolutely so i mean you know i'm not a proponent of, of never eating carbs not at all like i eat a lot of carbs and i think it's cool to just enjoy them they're part of life and so that's a question i get often it's like oh it was there a birthday party i just ate like five slices of chocolate cake it's probably not great for my glucose level. Is there anything I can do? And the good news is there is. So then the two main things are one, you can always drink some vinegar afterwards and it will still help your muscles uptake more glucose as it comes into your body. So, um, you know, a tall glass of water, one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, white wine vinegar, whatever you want. You can use a straw to protect your teeth. If you do that within two hours of eating the stuff, it's still going to help you. And then the other very immediate thing you can do when you just ate something that is spiking your glucose levels is to just contract your muscles to move your body. So go for a walk, do some push-ups, clean your apartment, go dancing. You know, this is the most effective way to get your glucose levels back down um, without increasing insulin too much. Because when your muscles are contracting, they can uptake glucose without needing insulin so it's like it's pretty good so vinegar and muscles mm. yeah like even like going for a walk mm -hmm. like a 10 minute walk and almost like cut it in half i think uh, exactly. the blood sugar response exactly yeah. exactly it's very very cool yeah 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 and most people just you know lay on the couch after eating the dinner or something uh, which is not the best uh, 
response actually so you should go yeah for it's not walk. the best i mean it's also fine but yes i agree like the, the short walk is really nice you know get a dog and walk your dog or <laughs> mm. even doing the dishes or you know cleaning your kitchen stuff like that is really helpful yeah mm. mm-hmm. um so we were talking a bit about like fasting and ketosis so um mm-hmm. have you tried uh, or measuring you know looking at uh, how does the fasting affect your blood sugar levels Totally. I mean, so when you're fasting, you're not eating anything. But what's remarkable is that your your glucose levels actually stay very, very steady because as you're using glucose, your liver is producing glucose to put into your bloodstream. So you see something extremely steady. And when you work out and you're fasted, you might actually see a spike in your glucose levels because that's your liver releasing glucose for your muscles to use. So depending on what you're doing, even when you're fasting, you might see some movement. But really, I mean, fasting and ketosis, that's when you see the steadiest glucose levels of all because you're not eating anything that turns to glucose. You're not eating any starches or sugars. So it's it's like, it's a pretty boring glucose curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the lowest you've been with the blood sugar? The lowest, God. I don't know, in the 80s, probably. Mm. Okay. Um, but the highest, I went to... So one thing that really blew my mind is that I once spiked to 200, mm. not after eating, but after a stressful presentation I had to give in front mm. of like 500 people. Mm-hmm. And the stress response in my body was such that the cortisol and everything pumped all this glucose into my system so that I could run away from the tiger that mm-hmm. wasn't there. <laughs> and with eating something, I think the highest was probably 180 when I ate like 12 cookies one day. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Uh, well, I don't remember. The lowest I've been has been like I did like once a five day fast and yeah. I measure, measured measured. Uh, not with the CGM, but with the finger prick, and uh, it was um, not precisely, I don't remember, but maybe in the 74 or 60, something like that, um, which is, you know, quite low, uh, but the highest, with, when I did with the CGM, that was, um, yeah, maybe 180, something like that. Uh, I didn't eat like a cheat meal or anything, but it was just like a high more voluminous food of, uh, let's say, maybe potatoes or something, uh, mm. because like, even if it's like healthy, like let's say, well, let's say whole foods like potatoes or fruit if, if it's like a large amount then that can also skew the results uh, or the blood sugar yeah. response can be higher compared to let's say one one oreo cookie <laughs> probably isn't gonna spike as my as high as like a kilo kilo of uh, potatoes or whatever totally absolutely however in the oreo there's also fructose because it's sweet so mm-hmm. it's actually probably worse to eat the oreo than to eat a bunch of potatoes just because of the presence of those <laughs> right <laughs> um stress uh stress uh, raises blood sugar mm. is you do you see like uh, also the diurnal change like in the morning when the cortisol production is naturally higher is it is your cgm yes. also elevated I see it really depends on the day. It's really incredible. So some days I have a little spike when I wake up. Some days I don't. Some days coffee might spike me. Other days it doesn't. There's so much I still don't understand about the the response of my body to things. Um, But yeah, I mean, the the morning spike is pretty common in most people. Mm. I think for me, it only doesn't happen if like, I'm on vacation or something and I, I don't have to wake up and I just kind of stay in bed for a long time. Then I see less of a spike. But mm. if I know I have to wake up early and I jump out of bed, then that's also, you know, my cortisol waking me up. So then I see a spike for sure. Yeah. Mm. Maybe like an, uh, using an alarm clock <laughs> would probably spike it uh, much higher than waking up naturally. Yes, 100%. Because you jump and you're like, oh my God, what is this? And so that's mm. that's the stress response. That mm-hmm. probably creates a glucose spike, yeah. <laughs> but again, like, okay, so, you know, glucose spikes are just part of life as well. Like, you're never yeah. going to be able to avoid the glucose spike when you wake up. So I, I don't want people to become um, obsessive. Like, if this starts being too stressful, like the spikes and everything, like, just 
just chill, focus on the hacks I share because that gets you 80% of the way there. Um, and be mindful, you know, if you have a history of becoming a bit too obsessive with numbers or if you have an eating disorder and stuff like that, just self-select when it's a good time or not a good time to wear a glucose monitor um, mm. because it can become it can become a bit stressful for some people. I think for most of us, it's, it's just very interesting and it allows us to connect with our biology in a new way. But mm. there's a small group of, a small segment of the population that um, needs to be mindful. Yeah. Mm. Have you like developed any like spidey sense around it that if you're not using the cgm can you still tell like okay approximately how much more blood sugar is going to be i think i'm mean? probably right now at like 94 <laughs> <laughs> i'm not wearing one right now um yes i've definitely developed a sense 100 mm. yes 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 nice. and you really can start feeling it in your mm. mental state like you can feel the spikes you're a little bit um, agitated, like, whoa, whoa, and then the drops, I mean, the drops, everybody can relate to that. It's like, you feel tired two mm. hours after a meal, or you have a craving for something really sweet in the middle of the afternoon. That's most likely a glucose drop after a spike. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you do feel a bit different if you have like high blood sugar, like your blood, almost like the blood flow is also like somewhat faster, like you can feel the blood flowing more rapidly or maybe like the heart rate is also increased oh you can feel your blood flow <laughs> well if it's like you know flowing fast faster yeah. than normally uh then uh you mean the heartbeat yeah but the blood, blood flow as well a little bit like you can feel the surge a little bit similar to like exercise if you're doing a cardio then you can still mm. feel like some blood surging through your system but if you eat like a hard, high carb meal then sometimes you'd also kind of uh, feel like yes that. you feel a bit like heated and a bit like yeah I see yeah that. yeah yeah about exercise, like uh, how does the exercise for you affect your blood sugar? Exercise is great for you, regardless of when you do it, what you do it. So it's always a good idea, 100%. What's kind of cool is to see that um, if you exercise after you just ate, your muscles are going to be using the glucose from that meal. And mm -hmm. if you exercise when you're fasted, your body's going to be releasing stored glucose to fuel your muscles. And so in that case, you might see a spike. It's not a bad spike. It's actually your body um, going through your reserves of glucose and spending them, which is excellent news. Um, so that can be something that is a little confusing to people sometimes. Like, why do I see a spike when I exercise? And I wrote a blog post that's called Why Spikes When You Exercise Are Good For You. It's mm. kind of like, it's one of those instances where a spike is not bad. Mm. So there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff to keep in mind. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but if you spike it, during exercise, then uh, are you still going to get like the blood vessel damage or the free radicals and things? Good question. So you do get that. But the cool thing is that exercise actually has also a lot of inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effects. And mm. so in the balance, it's actually positive and helpful for the body. Um, it's, it's a type of hormetic stress that actually is overall good, even though it is still a stressor the positive effects outweigh the negative consequences of the spike. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like exercise also raises inflammation and uh, creates these uh, free radicals and direct oxygen species, yeah. which are actually a part of some of the adaptations that you get. So like if you blunt those as uh, free radicals from exercise, then you're actually not going to like, or at least some of the adaptations are going to be smaller if you blunt like with antioxidants after exercise. So you'd actually need some of that inflammation to yeah experience the benefits of exercise so yeah not always it's they're not always bad exactly it's like insulin is not always bad like you need it mm. it's helpful for the body so we have to make sure to not overgeneralize things and exercise is always going to be helpful mm -hmm. for your body long term yeah even yeah. if there's a spike it's okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you've also been writing a book about this yeah uh, can, can you talk about it yeah totally so it's called glucose revolution Mm -hmm. And it's out uh, March 31st in Europe and English and April 5th in the US. And, you know, I learned so much about glucose and there's so much information that people asked me to put it all together because it's hard to know where to start. Um, so this book is the ultimate place. It's the one single thing you need to get your glucose levels steady and to start feeling amazing physically and mentally. It's kind of like, I like saying that my Instagram is the trailer and mm. the book is the movie, <laughs> okay. um, but it has way more that's on the than what's on the Instagram. It has a bunch of stories of people implementing the hacks. I dive into every single condition, physical and mental, affected by glucose. 
There are 10 hacks in there while there are only seven on my Instagram. Um, there's my story in there too, if people are interested. Mm. Um, and it's really, I hope it's going to become, you know, the staple of how to get your glucose level steady. I hope people will start with that. Nice, nice. And uh, where does it, where is it sold? Everywhere that book are sold. So <laughs> you can get it on Amazon, Glucose Revolution, the life-changing power of balancing your blood sugar, but also it's going to be in bookstores. It's coming out in over 15 languages. Um, so, and we're adding more languages all the time. So hopefully everywhere. But if you go on my Instagram, you can click the link in my bio and it has all the links for all the countries. Yeah, nice. my Instagram is Glucose Goddess for those who, who don't know. Nice, nice. Yeah, we're going to put all the links in the show notes. And um, I wanted to ask like, like, how often do you use the CGM? Because it lasts for 14 days. Yeah. Um, so like, do you use it all the time or how frequently do you actually use it? So the first two years I had it on the whole time. Um, and now I kind of cycle. So I do it like once or twice per trimester. So like about one out of every three months is what I do. Um, yeah, that seems to be a good, a good cadence because uh, I think all the time, sometimes you don't need it all the time. Yeah. But um, yeah, definitely at regular intervals is really, really great. So you can see how things are changing. You can check back in with your body. Mm. I love it that way, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, I think it's good to basically uh, have at least yeah, like a trial run of 14 days to get the baseline. Yeah. And uh, after that, you, if you're like healthy and everything is fine, then you probably don't need to track it all the time. But if you have, let's say, some uh, signs of prediabetes or something, then <laughs> maybe try it again a few uh, weeks later when you've changed things. Uh, but yeah, like not all the time is needed. Uh, but I think everyone should maybe do it like once, um, at least once in their lifetime or something. Yeah, and if you can afford it, it's really it's really just a nice partner to have mm. ongoingly and just to check back in. I think there's a lot of value even for people without prediabetes to to check back in with their glucose levels and on regular intervals. But um, it's up to it's up to the person to figure out what works for them for sure. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, it's been uh, great uh, talking with you. Uh, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? The best place is on Instagram, Glucose Goddess. That's the hub for everything. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Ooh, keeping my phone off for the first hour after I wake up. <laughs> nice. That's been a really big change in how I sort of set my my mind and my intention for the day and it's allowed me to really reduce stress and be much more um effective in what i want to achieve what i want to get done how i feel so that's a, that's a huge one for me yeah mm, nice good advice yeah it probably also <laughs> keeps the blood sugar low that you're not going to get uh, <laughs> yeah. tri triggered by some news or <laughs> totally absolutely yeah yes. thank All you right. for having me sim it was really nice yeah it was great to talk <laughs> take care bye <laughs>